Okay. So this is the uh, last session of Chaos 2019 before the social dinner, uh, which I will remind you is at 7.30, and it's at Tema, which is a restaurant um, 200 yards to the left when you go out the front door on the other side of the street. We're not going to meet anywhere and then go as a group. We're all going to meet at the restaurant at 7.30. Okay? Got that? Good. So, it gives me uh, pleasure to welcome Ivan Tony to the stage, who's going to talk to us. Oh, it's on the screen. Oh, great. So, you know already. Okay. <laughs> great. Ivan. Okay. So... Thanks, and thanks for inviting me at this talk. I thought to use this occasion to throw up for discussion and to public scrutiny some ideas we have been having uh, to ground some of our work on human communication. And I thought this uh, venue with so many experts on event cognition and uh, concept is uh, probably the best venue for uh, bringing this up. So I need a couple of slides to unpack this notion of epistemic engineering that is uh, crucial for uh, what I want to say. And uh, I'll try to do so through an analogy. And uh, so let me get started. And let me start with one, I think, strong example, a uh, strong anchor point, one of the watershed moments in the history of thought, uh, the suggestion by Darwin of uh, selection, <coughs> evolution by means of natural selection, and uh, a particular dangerous aspect of this idea. It's not a dangerous aspect that uh, Daniel Dennett has been focusing on. It's an aspect that uh, Ernst Meyer has been uh, uh, discussing uh, before his death. And um, the point is the transition from the sort of typological thinking that was predominant in Western thought, at least before Darwin, where there were species. And these were created by some optimization process by uh, God. And the idea that with Darwin, that that is not relevant for understanding biological organization. Biological organization is based on tokens, is based on individual phenotypes on which natural selection can operate. And phenotypes that adapt to the current circumstances given their previous history of adaptations. And uh, this, of course, was triggered by the actually postdoc consideration that Darwin made visiting the Galapagos uh, Islands, where you have uh, a founder that must have reached those islands that are separated by a large distance from the mainland. And then you see differentiation in the species, in this case, the finches of Darwin saw there. And if you have this prototype idea of species, then there could be random variation, but there should not be systematic variation in between the different islands and related to the ecological habitat that you experience in the different islands. So this is important because it brings the emphasis on the, how actually natural selection operates through contingent thinking. So it's very contingent on the environment in which a certain phenotype, a certain token is embedded. And that is dramatically different from the idea of this optimization process that was predominant before Darwin. And I need another point to put on the table to sort of build my analogy that, that brings, I bring to other domain that I want to speak about. And that is a more recent development introduced uh, in evolutionary theory uh, by, uh, among others, Kevin Lalland. And the idea there is that you move from contingent tinkering to contingent engineering. And the idea there is that the phenotype, the token, is not just a passive uh, element in the environment, but actually by virtue of its very presence, and often by virtue of actively changing the environment, there is a degree of engineering, so that there is not just a genetic inheritance system, there is also an ecological inheritance system, or niche selection, or niche creation, where the organism creates or modifies the niche, and that as a, can be inherited through generations. Think of a dam for a, a, a population of beavers. And that modifies, in turn, the 
pressures, selective pressures uh, of natural selection on that particular phenotype. So now, this is the elements I put on the table for my analogy. Now imagine that instead of traveling to this physical space on Earth, this Galapagos Island, you travel to a different type of virgin space, a, a space where an organism that has access to a possibly large number of uh, mappings between signal and reference is transplanted into. So what we call uh, ob obscurely somehow a semiotically virgin environment. So this is an environment, as I say, not in physical space, but in semiotic space, in the space of signal reference mappings. And the idea similar to the question that Darwin asked himself is how do organisms populate this uh, environment? Do they comply to the idea of uh, optimal optimization process of, talk of types that uh, optimally parcelate uh, the certain space of possibilities, or is something more contingent on the situations on the ground? And this is what my talk is about. So this question has been asked in the past, starting with philosophers, so the famous example of the Gavagai rabbit uh, from uh, William Quine, and in the context of how do we communicate with aliens where we don't have a shared sem semiotic space. We have no idea what count as a signal for them and what that signal might refer to. And this idea, I'm glad to see that has taken also uh, uh, ground on the uh, sort of popular imagination with a recent movie that uh, is very relevant to this talk. And other people have sort of wondered, again, in philosophical space, how can we communicate with other humans, like us, but far away in time, in 50,000 years from now, where time has destroyed all the possible physical artifacts we can think of making now, and yet we want to convey some signal, like this, the location of a, a dump site for nuclear waste, so that people are not uh, radiated by accessing that nuclear waste. And how do we do that? And you can say, well, these are just philosophical problems that uh, you not necessarily need to stay awake at night about. But of course, there are also more practical problems, like how do people that get access to human isolated populations, like in Papua New Guinea, in the islands, manage to interact with these uh, populations, despite lacking a common set of uh, reference and signals? Or maybe you have experienced the same problem here today in Rovereto if you don't speak Italian or you don't find a nati native here that is fluent in English, how do you interact as a tourist? And the point of the talk is actually this is not a, at all an exotic problem. It's a problem that we face every day, every time we interact with our peers, because our mind are largely encapsulated from each other. We have, of course, a large number of regularization processes that allow us to share a number of uh, signal and reference and signal reference mappings, but these rely also on a lot of ambiguity, that's where their the power comes from, and we need to resolve this ambiguity all the time. So this is actually a very current and per per pervasive problem. And as I said, you can think of solving it by recording to types, by optimizing some coding decoding mechanism, and choose some optimum given some shared set of constraints that you might think uh, are universal across individuals. And there have been some suggestions in the past, uh, like, for instance, the fact that we rely on shared sensory motor experiences and that give ground to all possible uh, signal reference mappings that we can think of. And I'm glad to see that uh, largely, thanks to some people here in the audience, that suggestion has been uh, somehow put to the margin. But it's still alive in some form in uh, work on brain-to-brain -brain coupling where the emphasis is on the processes that are automatically shared between individuals in the way we interpret some uh, signal reference mappings. And often, this work is also driven by the fact that we as experimenter, we introduce those, that shared ground, those shared mechanisms, those uh, in, um, relations that are invariant between individuals, not because they are necessarily so, but because uh, uh, the experimenter do that. And a different so if this is true, then when you bring people in this semiotically virgin environment where people don't have access or cannot use pre-existing signal reference mappings, then the hypothesis from this uh, line of thought is that people should converge. People should converge on the same 
single reference mappings because they are driven by the same optimization process, because they are driven by the same intrinsic constraints. And the suggestion I want to make, and I uh, will provide some evidence that uh, we can discuss today, is that I think the way we, we navigate, we explore this uh, virgin space, semantically virgin space, is similar to the way we colonize, uh, organism colonize a virgin island. That is, we have some engineering, so it's not just that we are exposed to the situation at hand, we navigate through the possible space of possibilities with some, uh, making some inferences and, and shaping the relation with another interlocutor during communication. So there is an epistemic engineering component, but it's contingent on the particular conditions on the ground, similar way that uh, those finches were sensitive to the particular ecological conditions on a different island. So if that is the case, then we can achieve communication over and above the, in, uh, in the fact that we have a degree of common ground to begin with, but we can fine tune our communicative exchange by engineering how we navigate these uh, possi possibilities in the semiotic space by, for instance, recurring to the presumed uh, knowledge that we have about uh, another individual. And this line of thought will lead to the prediction that the way we, we colonize this semiotically virgin space is very idiosyncratic, is very dependent on the particular interlocutor we are facing, and is very dependent on how the, the interaction actually evolves. And you might say, well, okay, if that is the case, we can close the shop here because there is no regularity. And I'm not saying that. I'm saying that there are possible principles that, that allow us to investigate this issue scientifically, but it is not just, the, the problem is not solved by just focusing on what is shared a priori, what is already there. I think there is a lot of inferential work that needs to be done on each and every interaction we engage with if we want to be able to uh, influence the mind of somebody else. So there is work out there, of course, that has addressed this issue, that has experimentally manipulated the situation so that people are faced with signal and reference that they don't have any pre-existing mappings for, and they need to select uh, some of these mappings. And uh, this is, for instance, very influential work from Simon Kirby. And I think I want to put it here on the table because I think is not what I'm speaking about. So this is about iterated learning and is very instrumental in understanding the bottlenecks that a language, a language system might have in order to be able to be learned and transmitted across generations. But this is not what I'm speaking about. I'm speaking about the ability to converge on shared signal reference mappings on one or two turns of an interaction. It's not across several thousand turns, across several generations. It's a very uh, rapid convergence that we achieve every day when we interact with our peers. And another element that differentiates uh, the work I'm going to show you from this pre-existing work is that we, um, <clears throat> in a sense here, the signals and the reference are given by the experimenter. And that it can be adequate to address certain questions, but it's not adequate when you want to study the generation of a new, com of a new communicative system, when you want to understand how a certain semiotic space is colonized by somebody that doesn't have any uh, access to that, to any possible pre-existing referent. So we need to also allow participants, people that we study, to generate those systems, not impose a particular system as we do in, in this case by giving a certain set of uh, instructions or uh, by, for instance, showing a movie to people that, in a sense, that is already a pre-existing set of reference that we uh, impose to the participants. And so another point to, to give some background is that, of course, uh, nature itself provides us with some situations where we can track, describe the emergence of a novel communicative system. And these are famous situations of uh, people that are born deaf to families that don't have access to uh, sign language. And so they are linguistically isolated from the rest of the community. But when groups of these individuals don't just uh, live uh, in, in, inside their home, but they manage to aggregate for a number of reasons, then they, you can see and track the emergence of a new communicative system that can be very articulate and where syntax emerge actually quite rapidly and where 
uh, a number of operations that are uh, def defining uh, language actually seems to emerge also in these, uh, very rapidly in these uh, <coughs> um, environments. So with this background, I'm going to focus now on uh, how I work, and I hope I made clear the, the rationale for engaging in, in this work, and now I'm going to give you some bits of evidence about that. So the focus is on the generation of a new communicative system, because we think that by tapping this issue, we can gain some insights on how we resolve the multiple ambiguities that we have every day when we communicate with language, for instance, where there is a, a very large body, of course, of shared meaning, but where, again, the ambiguities of the language uh, that we use is, uh, needs to be resolved continuously. And that requires we hypothesize the same process as when we generate this new communicative system. And we want also to be able to do so not by constraining the set of possibilities, but by having the same problems that people face in, in, in the wild, like these uh, home signers, where you, in principle, can generate any signal that can map onto any referent. And so we don't want to constrain the field uh, to uh, oversimplify the problem on a crucial feature of the problem that needs to be solved. And because we want to look at the, this colonization of uh, a semiotically verging system, we want to minimize, of course, the degree to which you rely and reproduce pre-existing, pre-established conventions. So we need to have a system that is somehow artificial in the sense that you cannot uh, just use uh, the common language that everybody has uh, in a certain community. And so we also want to minimize this access to linguistic or gestural conventions and minimize access to uh, other communicative systems like uh, emotional systems that can uh, facilitate communication but that would impair our ability to isolate this, uh, this phenomenon. So this again is a quick summary of this talk on this is the main question we want to address and if you want to uh, say it in a more uh, plain English is how do we understand each other when we are communicating and we are going to show you behav behavioral evidence on this topic, uh, some computational simulations, and neural observations, and sort of using the straw man of uh, optimal signal reference mapping, where different people, different pairs, different interlocutors should converge on the same type of signal reference mappings with the uh, uh, sort of epistemic engineering idea where the convergence that you achieve is very idiosyncratic to each pair and very contingent on the situations on the ground. And most of the talk I'm going to show you is uh, data obtained in the context of a particular game we have developed over the years. And here I'm going to show you how it works. It's a situation, as I say, that where we try to satisfy those uh, desires that I, I spelled out uh, a, few, a few slides ago, where people cannot communicate linguistically. They are constrained by a relatively unfamiliar system. The system looks deceivingly simple. Is a relatively uh, simple setup, but it allows actually people to uh, choose signals and uh, map them to a particular reference from a potentially very large set of possibilities. I'm going to show you some evidence for that. So we have two people that are interacting online, live. They are, set, they are standing in different rooms, so they don't speak with each other, they don't see each other, they don't smell each other. They uh, are simply facing a computer screen and controlling uh, uh, game controller. We have done it also with touch screen, with other modalities, it doesn't really matter. And we offer some information to one of the two interlocutors or the two participants and to achieve a certain goal state. And then the participant needs to uh, do something so that the other, the other addressee can adjust her behavior to that and jointly achieve a certain goal, goal state. I hope this becomes clearer as I show you the video. So this is an actual video from one of the interactions that we recorded from one of our pairs. So the two people are assigned the roles. They know that it's a communicative exchange. And they're given a token they need to move on this uh, board. This is the board they need to play with. Sorry, I lost my mouse. And, uh, this three by three board is a board they need to move their token on. So the blue participant has access and control to the blue token. The orange participant, the addressee, has access to the orange token. It's a three by three board where the token can move horizontally and vertically. And the 
triangle, for instance, can rotate, whereas the circle can rotate, but the rotations are not visible. And um, the two participants at the end of this trial need to achieve this configuration. Only the, address, the communicator knows the configuration. And by virtue of moving the token on the board, the communicator needs to somehow convince the addressee to put her token on that particular location on the board and in that particular uh, orientation. And you can think yourself how you would solve this problem if you were a communicator in this particular game. Oops, sorry, clicked wrong place. Um, so. So the communicator is thinking how to solve the problem. And now it's start to move. And now the addressee can move according to what, how she interprets that movement from the communicator. So you can see it's a very deceivingly simple setup. And uh, you might say, well, here I'm just wasting your time uh, before, before we go to dinner, because you can say, well, this, what is this to do with communication? This is trivially simple. There isn't much to be done here. So again, to summarize again the problem, you need to convince the addressee to put the token in that location and orientation. You might say, well, what do I do? I do exactly what the participant did. I go there, I wait a little bit, and then I maybe do some additional movement to indicate the orientation of the triangle, and then I go to my location, and the game is finished. So you might say, well, what is the open-ended nature of the game? There, is just, there are just two possibilities. Either you stay in one place, or you turn your uh, token. Uh, not a big deal. But it turns out that this would be a very superficial way of thinking about the game, uh, because the simple movement that you saw there, this left and right, what we call a wiggle, in different pairs, and often even within the same pair, turns out to um, be linked to a number of different possibilities. So in some cases, the participants converge on the notion that moving that in that way means that the addressee needs to press a button that determines the rotation according to the number of the movements that you have observed. That's one possibility. Another possibility is that the communicator invites the addressee to align the base of the triangle with the direction of that movement. That's another possibility that would generate a completely different mapping. And another possibility, for instance, is that you are referring not to the base of the triangle, but to the height of the triangle, and so on and on. And we have a number, a quite large number now, of strategies that we have decoded over the years across a very large number of participants. So in reality, the game is quite complex because you actually capture, and empirically you can show that's the case, a large number of possibilities in this space of signal reference mappings, where the same signal can have a relatively large number of reference, and the same reference can be uh, addressed to by a, a relatively large number of different signals. And again, to test, to have a first uh, qualitative observation on this notion, how do people colonize this space? So they haven't had an experience with this game. We designed it on purpose to be uh, quite uh, virgin. And do people converge on the same way of solving it? You might say, well, I have the perfect solution to this game, because on the basis of some uh, cost function, I know that that is the optimal way of solving the game. And some people approach the game in this way, and those people terribly fail because, of course, your communication system is only successful as far as the other person understands it. If you are convinced that your system you have is the best one, often that doesn't bring you very far. And indeed, when we look at people, these are just three exemplary pairs, and uh, this is a complicated way of showing time. I like to show time on a circle. Uh, and so you have trial, trials across this circle, and the different strategies, different signal reference mappings are indicated as along the uh, uh, radius of that circle as with Roman letter, letters, and the gray black lines are the trajectory in this signal reference mapping space of three different pairs. And you can see that they start from different strategies, 
and they navigate the space in quite a idiosyncratic manner, and most importantly, by the end of the 45 trials they have at hand, they land on different strategies they more or less systematically stick to, and that successfully converge with their addressee, and that again reinforces my point that when you put people in this semiotically verging space, they end up doing fairly idiosyncratic and often fairly fleeting, so changing very rapidly strategies. And nevertheless, they manage to be fairly successful across the whole set of interactions and manage to understand each other. So these are very descriptive preliminary evidence to the notion that actually in these circumstances, you, people don't converge on a set of optimal strategy uh, and they tend to generate these idiosyncratic and possibly fleeting uh, signal reference mappings. We uh, also look at a situation where we had reason to believe, to expect, that there might be problems in the uh, ability of these participants to gain access to, the, to these uh, constraints that people might use to converge on uh, signal reference mappings that can be understood by their partner. And these are situations with uh, of uh, situation of patients with autism spectrum disorder, where the, the, the disorder is defined by communicative impairments, and they, surprisingly, there is relatively little work on uh, uh, individuals with autism actually communicating with uh, another individual in a quantitative uh, setting beyond the clinical diagnosis, the clinical setup in which these patients are tested. And so we decided to go in with this uh, setup that allow us to quantify the interaction in fairly precise terms, uh, given the nature of, of the game. And this is a, a representation I'm going to give you of a similar trajectory through the semiotic space for a neurotypical pair. This is a different representation that's supposed to give you a sort of bird's eye view of how people navigate through this space. And each letter is a strategy. And now we have gone up to the U strategy. I forgot how many, more than 20. And, uh, for a particular trial. So you can see that the two participants, here they are coded by uh, orange and the blue line, they tend to have a cluster of uh, strategy that is the A strategy. That is the simplest strategy you can so use in the game and is just uh, going to a certain location, wait there a little while, and then go to your location. And that is just a, a strategy that works to indicate the location of the token, but it doesn't solve the problem of indicating the orientation of the token. So it's a starting strategy that many people start with, but then quickly they converge on a different strategy. And this pair converges on the J strategy, but again, as I showed you in the previous slide, that is not a given. Different pairs converge on different strategies. And you can see that occasionally, one individual might explore a number of different strategies, but they are quickly dropped if the other participants doesn't follow. So when you see only a blue line or orange line, that indication that this strategy was considered, but then dropped because it was not understood by the addressee. And now you can contrast this situation with the situation we observe in a pair of uh, uh, patients with autism, where you can see that, again, there is a strong cluster on the A strategy, and there is also another cluster, in this case, on the G strategy, but you have a much larger number of exploration of different strategies that are not followed by the interlocutor. So where largely blue lines or largely orange lines are uh, present. So these patients actually come up with possibly a larger, well, statistically it was matched to the number of strategies of the neurotypical individuals, but the strategies they come up with are not informed by the strategies or the plausible interpretation that would be uh, implemented by the addressee. And so these strategies remain, remain isolated. They don't manage to converge on a common strategy with the interlocutor, in particular when the demands of the task are higher, when there are, there are a number of communicative problems to be solved. And this is just a reminder, I don't have time to go into the details of these, just a reminder that for all other parameters that we can think of that we could measure in these patients and in, in the control group, there was no difference. So the, the only difference that these patients had was in the ability to converge on a common strategy with the interlocutor. There was no difference in, for instance, the motivation that these patients might have 
on generating communicative strategies that was matched to the controls, or there was no uh, limitation, no problem in considering whether the other participants understood or not understood the, the strategy in terms of uh, adjusting the movement with some superficial features, like slowing down the movement when it is communicatively relevant. So this is a, an example of what can go wrong when you don't manage to take into account the local environment, the contingent context generated by your interlocutor when you need to in interact in situations where there isn't an obvious uh, uh, shared set of symbols to, to work with. So <clears throat> another point I want to go through is a question that arises in our mind and say, well, okay, how much of this is actually driven by this peculiar game that we play with? Is really, does it really generalize to, to linguistic communication? And could it be that some of the things we see is just because we force people to actually uh, access this situation with possibly random uh, set of signal reference mappings that they might generate, they might think of, but there isn't anything to, to map with. So there isn't really uh, something that could generate some symmetry in the signal reference mappings as we have in language and through the uh, large process of regularization that we have in language through um, uh, learning languages and uh, daily interaction. So again, and the dominant model in the, the context of dialogue on, on linguistic communication, of course, presupposes a large degree of uh, symmetry in the mappings across interlocutor, because uh, this is the model from Pickering and Garrod, where you have this mutual priming operating, and the mutual priming needs to operate on something that is already there, and these are these uh, pre-existing symmetric, symmetric mapping between uh, signals and reference. So we had a shot at this issue, not by going into language, I'm very reluctant to move there because I don't know anything about language, but uh, we also because we didn't think we had enough, uh, would have enough control, so we went there with uh, 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 computer simulation, where we thought, well, let's have a uh, consider a situation where we can impose a known set of uh, mappings and manipulate the ambiguity of this mapping and manipulate other parameters that we think are important in generating these uh, shared uh, symbols across interlocutor in a, a synthetic environment as a computational simulation. And so we, what we manipulated was the degree of symmetry between the interlocutors. So to what extent a certain mapping between a certain movement and a certain referent was matched between the two interlocutors. And we can do that uh, on a uh, very precise manner because that is the, what we can control in the simulation with agent-based simulation. And we can also control very precisely the degree of pragmatic inference that people make. So in common parlance, this is, would be intended as a mentalizing or theory of mind process, and here we can actually formalize it uh, in, in pre precisely with the recursive uh, <coughs> process of different degrees, and we can endow different agents with different degrees of problematic inference. And this was based on the Rational Speech Act model of Frank and Goodman. And you can, of course, also manipulate the degree of referential ambiguity that these agents experience in the world, so that in some cases you might have low ambiguity where a certain movement only refers to a certain uh, referent. In other cases, there is more ambiguity between movement and reference. And so I'm going to show you a complex plot where we manipulate the referential ambiguity, we manipulate interlocutors asymmetry, and we manipulate the level of pragmatic inference of those agents. And we evalu evaluate that in terms of success of these uh, agents, these are uh, simulations, uh, com computer simulations of a one-shot interaction. So it's not an uh, iterative game, this is a one-shot interaction, and the dots I'm going to show you are the average of a few thousand of these uh, iterations across uh, agents. So what you see here is that you, uh, you can start from zero referential ambiguity, we consider eight uh, uh, possible reference, and um, in that case, having higher pragmatic abilities, being able to anticipate or reason on how an addressee would interpret your signal, or iteratively so at second or third level, doesn't really gain you anything. So the three curves, the three colors are overlapping. And you can see that, of course, when there is no ambiguity and when there is no asymmetry, when the two interlocutors have exactly the same set of 
mappings, then communication is perfect, but that, of course, doesn't represent or doesn't capture any biologically realistic situation that we experience in, in our culture. So as the referential ambiguity increases, you can see something that at first glance might appear quite counterintuitive. The notion there is that uh, <clears throat> when you increase ambiguity and asymmetry, if the agent has some degree of mentalizing ability, if it can reason about how the addressee might interpret those actions, then you might, the blue curve might be above the red curve, even for a relatively limited amount of asymmetry. So the suggestion there is that under ambiguity and asymmetry, if you have some pragmatic ability, then you can even be better of agents that are just identical in, the terms, in terms of their mapping. And uh, this is uh, just a message that I try to take home. And so this actually points to the fact that the intrinsic ambiguity that we have in our uh, linguistic communication might not be uh, something detrimental, might be actually something that when coupled with our uh, pragmatic abilities, mind reading abilities, might allow us to uh, uh, improve our performance and without relying on the unlikely assumption and necessity of having uh, complete asy asymmetry between the interlocutor. So this is a quick interim summary. How are we going for time? You've got 10 minutes. Ooh. Okay. So uh, of what I've been telling you about. So I've been trying to elaborate a bit on the notion of epistemic engineering and how it leads to the intuition that you might need to generate uh, single reference mappings that are fairly idiosyncratic and contingent on the type of interaction you are experiencing, and then give you some very qualitative evidence uh, supporting that and the consequence of that, and uh, how referential ambiguity and asymmetry is actually important for uh, human communication and that in a way that uh, allow us to uh, outperform uh, at least in this simulation, agents that have uh, complete symmetry, and uh, we don't need to rely on that. So uh, I need to rush up a bit. Let me see what I have here. So I'm going to give you a piece of evidence that comes from uh, some imaging work we've been doing in this context, and this was a, a first shot we had, actually it was a second or third shot, but uh, at this point, again, elaborating on one of the possible consequences of this notion, and that is that if we really have these idiosyncratic signal reference mappings, then the relation between individuals, what drives successful communication, should be somehow independent from the individual signal. It is not in this, the point is that the communication success is not in the signal, is how the signal is embedded in the existing context determined by the interlocutor. So, the question we ask there is, at what time scale there is nearer overlap between interlocutor? Is really some synchronization process uh, that happens real time between interlocutors that is driven by the signal that are provided uh, by the interlocutor to each other? Or is there some contextual updating, or contextual inf uh, influence that operates over time scales that are not bound to a particular signal, but necessarily need to operate over a number of, of, of interactions. So we tested these by having people playing our game together in two separate scanners at the same time, because again, the notion is that people interacting generate this context and is very contingent on the interaction. So we cannot test them in separate point on time. We need to test them at the same time. And we tested these in relation to other people playing the same game also together, and then we could generate real pairs that were actually playing the game with each other versus what we call pseudo pairs or random pairs that, has, that is communicator and addressees that are playing the game, solving the same problems, but not together. And if this idea that what, how we come to understand each other is really contingent on the interaction context we have, then there should be something special about two pairs interacting with each other as compared to other, other pairs playing the same game, being exposed to the same stimuli, being, uh, pr producing the same responses, but not interacting with each other. And we also wanted to make something that was relevant for the communicative success, and so we played with the mappings. So we have situations where people could retrieve mappings that they already have converged on, 
by, in a training session where they have agreed already that that particular movement is referring to that particular token configuration versus situations where they need to generate this novel meaning from scratch. They are really familiar with the game, but they still can present problems where they haven't found a solution for, and then how do they solve that particular problem? So is <clears throat> some, should be something really specific to the colonization of the semiotical emerging space where there isn't really already uh, established signal reference mapping. So I'm going to briefly give you an example of how you can look at brain-to-brain -brain coordination and get it wrong or at least get uh, sort of trivial effects and make uh, possibly a big story out of it. So this is the signal we see in uh, sensory motor cortex of real pairs matched by the map by the green line versus random pair mapped by the uh, uh, black line. And you see that the sensory motor cortex in communicator and address C matched in uh, blue and orange are very well tuned to each other. They are perfectly antiphase. What you see here is bold signal as a function of time. The dashed lines are the markers of different trials. And here you see the, the signal in sensory motor cortex of these two individuals as they process to the game. And you can see that there is a perfect brain-to-brain -brain coupling here. And a, a fancy way, but I think a more informative way of describing that pattern is by just showing it uh, in terms of coherence as a function of frequency, and you can see that there is a peak uh, of coherence at the frequency marked by the dash line that is the experimental frequency. And the phase gap between those two uh, waveforms is about seven seconds, and that is the average time it takes for uh, the C to respond to the movements of the communicator. So what we see here is basically what we put into the system. We ask people to move, in turns, and what we get is signal that reflects that demand. So it's the task demand we impose on the participants and we get it back. Is, is it interesting? I don't think it's particularly interesting. And indeed, when we look at how this uh, region responds to this manipulation of known versus uh, uh, novel mappings, so the K and the N, we can see that this uh, signal is not particularly interested in differentiating between between the known and the novel mappings, and it does so at the same level as random pairs. Indication that this is not where the action is when people need to, gen to establish, jointly establish, new signal reference mappings. What we see is another region on the right hemisphere in the superior temporal gyrus where there is brain-to-brain -brain coupling, but it is at surprisingly low frequencies. So it's well beyond the frequency of the experimental that we introduce is frequency spanning multiple uh, turns, and you can see that in the pattern of uh, bold signal where the coupling between the two interlocutors is not perfect, of course, is a biological system, but it sort of slowly oscillates uh, across multiple trials. And we interpret this as uh, indication that this contextual effect is indeed uh, coupling these uh, two interlocutor and allowing them to solve the problem by allowing them to interpret or generate a certain communicative signal in the light of what has been done recently by the other interlocutor. And indeed, when we look at the pattern of response as a function of our manipulation, we see that uh, the real pairs show a stronger response in this region during novel uh, mappings and uh, not during uh, known mappings indication that this region might have something to say in the way people generate and interpret a signal given the recent history of interaction of that particular pair. So this uh, point make the point that establishing this mutual understanding is implemented to some matching in the cerebral responses in the dynamic of the responses between interlocutors, but these dynamics are nothing to, to do with the dynamics we impose as experimental in terms of experimental procedure, actually operating over temporal scales that are much lower than what we um, <clears throat> put in. And this, again, points to the somehow primacy of this conceptual alignment procedure uh, during communicative interaction. And I give you the example of what, uh, how it then turns out when people don't manage to take that into account and they consider each trial somehow in isolation without considering the history. So I suppose my time has gone off. Okay, so let me see what I have here. I had a teaser for Alfonso, but in the rest of time, I skip it. I will go to speak with him later about these. And uh, I'm...
briefly going to tell you also another piece of evidence of what happens uh, when <coughs> you might have a patholo pathological loss or communicative adjustment. And again, here is another set of another study where we try to tease apart the contribution of different regions in the ability to generate these new signal reference mappings. I show you the contribution of the superior temporal gyrus. Uh, it's not quite in the temporal uh, pole, actually, it's quite posterior to that, but is uh, anterior to the, uh, definitely to the auditory cortex. In terms of synchronizing between uh, different interlocutors, I show you how the distributed uh, diffuse lesion that, uh, alteration that you have in uh, possibly in an autistic brain lead to this inability to take into account the recent context. And uh, what I'm going to show you is that other lesions in other parts of the brain lead to different type of impairment. So these uh, patients here we studied have a lesion on the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and they were tested on, again as communicator in a slightly adjusted version of the game that is designed more for patients and for children. And in that case, we could see different type of impairments. So these patients, they're actually fairly good in communicating with uh, uh, interlocutor, healthy interlocutor, but what they miss is the ability to adjust their uh, communicative behavior to the particular characteristics of the addressee. And the way we play with that is by telling them that in some trials they were playing with a little girl that happens to be my daughter many years ago. And in other cases, they were playing with an uh, uh, adult uh, individual. And so we counted on the fact that when we test these in healthy subjects or even in children, people automatically adjust to these presumed characteristics of the RSE, and they tend to be a bit more emphatic in their movement, not in, in general, but only in the portions of the movement that are communicatively relevant. And so they adjust their communicative behavior to the presumed characteristics of the RSC in the same way that I would do with my linguistic behavior. And what we see in uh, these patients is that despite being able to generate communicative solutions to the problem, and despite the fact of being able to solve the problem, what they miss is the ability to adjust their behavior to the characteristics of the RSC. So they don't adjust. Here you can see uh, in this plot, if I get my mouse there, you can see the degree of adjustment in uh, this manipulation of the two different addressee, and here you have the uh, percentage adjustment in uh, uh, lesion controls and healthy subjects, and you can see that this is different from zero, whereas in uh, the patients, if anything, there is a, a, a counter adjustment in the other direction. And similarly, they don't adjust to the situation where there is a communicative error, where the message is not understood by an addressee, healthy subject and lesion control, they tend again to be a bit more emphatic in, this, in those circumstances and these patients fail to do so. So there is a, a different type of impairment, not so much about the generation of the communicative signal, they are fine there, but they are, fine, they are missing the ability to adjust the communicative signal to the contingent uh, interlocutor or the characteristic of the interlocutor they think they are playing with. So I had a couple of, I was always over ambitious on my ability to speak fast, and I don't. Uh, so I'm going, to, yeah, I'm going to skip this work in progress, and uh, I'm going to conclude on uh, what I've been trying to put on the table today, this notion of epistemic engineering. I stole the idea from uh, Kim Sterling, a philosopher. He uses it in a slightly different context. The way I like to use it is to think of it as our ability to uh, sort of shape, influence the trajectory that we need to follow in this possible space of signal reference mappings, in particular when we don't have a common solid, solid ground to in, in, interact with other interlocutors. And I try to make the claim that this is not an exotic phenomenon, but it's something that happens every day in most of the communication we are engaged with. And I'm going to show you, I show you some evidence for the fact that this happens in a fairly idiosyncratic manner and what happens when people fail to take into account this context and they uh, sort of generate solutions that are not uh, informed by what an addressee has been doing or might be possibly be interpreting. I also show you how you, uh, different portion of the brain might support an another element of this ability to communicate, that is to conceptually update a model of the addressee as the interaction is taking place. And I'm going to uh, show you some evidence on um, <coughs> showing that there is match uh, dynamics between interlocutors, but this is mainly related to the ability to incorporate uh, 
existing context accumulated over a long period of time rather than being triggered by a particular individual signal. And this is the people that have done this work. There is work in progress that I haven't showed you, but nevertheless, I mentioned the initiative is a large uh, multidisciplinary and multi-PI project that we've been, been engaged with where uh, we finally uh, closed the, uh, crossed the Rubicon to actual language use, and uh, these are the people that are involved uh, in this project. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. We have time for questions. Yep. Microphone. Sure. I can just chat. Um, I uh, have a question about your continuity of paradigms. I wonder if you've ever looked at individual differences in uh, participants, either you know, um, communicators or addressees' ability to mind read and what uh, these kinds of measures would use to see you know, how they might predict their communicative behavior. Well, we, we try to um, use some um, scales, neuropsychological scales, to characterize the profile of the individuals. And there is some evidence that it might, you might be more successful if you are high on the need for cognition or um, in a systematizing uh, quotient to a certain extent. But uh, those, to be honest, they were quite inconclusive. What we saw that what I think was a bit more interesting is that you can uh, sort of oil the wheels of the system by using oxytocin. And it's, you can do that in a quite interesting way in the sense that by uh, administering oxytocin to individuals, uh, the in, uh, interlocutor starts to uh, become um, more sensitive to the space of possibilities. So instead of solving, again, one trial in isolation, they generate solutions that look ahead. So they generate solutions that can cover a large space of problems that those that have actually experienced up until then. So you can uh, play with, to a certain degree, I think, with intermediate variability in the sense of uh, considering how much people are really focused on solving a particular problem, similar to what we see actually in the autistic pairs. And to what extent they uh, look ahead and they consider the space of possibility that this particular game might be offering, even without having experienced those particular problems. Um. I apologize if I've misunderstood something super basic <laughs> here, but um, you, they got after every trial feedback, Sorry. right? They, after every trial, they got feedback. They get feedback on whether they solve the problem yes. or not. Okay. But we don't give feedback on what the problem was. No, right, but they know whether they did it correctly or not. That, that seems like a really um, potentially important decision that you've made in this paradigm that doesn't seem totally realistic um, in what you're trying to model um, because people don't always know when they well, are... People don't know what the reference is in dialogue and communication. We don't know what we are speaking about. Right. But they can signal a misunderstanding. They can engage in repair. But I think a lot of times there are misunderstandings because people Sorry. don't... I think a lot of times there are misunderstandings in communication uh, that people don't know that they're having. Um, and so I'm just wondering whether that's something that's worth varying to look at the consequences of feedback. Maybe, in, maybe it's inconsistently given. Maybe some trials there's feedback, sometimes there's not. Maybe sometimes the feedback is incorrect, so they think they've succeeded, but they actually haven't. So if you made the feed, feedback signal less consistent, right now it's 100% accurate. If you made it sometimes absent or sometimes inaccurate, it seems like that could change a lot of these dynamics. I wonder whether you think that's worth exploring? Uh, possibly. Uh, we consider that manipulation when we started to um, uh, exclude a number of possibilities, whether indeed people were uh, really caring about uh, what the other would be doing or not. And we saw that in that case by excluding the possibility of seeing, for instance, what the uh, addressee would, would be doing. So it's not exactly what you're asking, but whether the communicator has access to what 
the addressee is doing or not, that changes dramatically the, the communication. So the addressee, yeah. the communicator definitely uh, wants to as an idea, have an idea of how that particular signal was interpreted by the uh, addressee. Uh, altogether changing, I mean, one issue that bugs me in, in this game is that there isn't really a, 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 a dynamic of repairs. So differently from uh, natural uh, communication, uh, we uh, give this point uh, feedback without having the people, uh, giving people the possibility to engage in different forms of repair. And that is something that we are planning to yeah. explore indeed. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I think I might have missed the force of the analogy with which you started to Darwin. Um, but um, with respect to what I took to be the main theoretical conclusion about epistemic engineering that people navigate this shared space, can you, like, what's the alternative to that? Like, I don't, it's not clear to me, like, what the alternative, how else could it be? I mean, how, how else would it be if, if you do have, you know, functioning abilities to draw inferences about what another person knows and you have a good grasp of what it is that you want to communicate, then, you know, what is the alternative framework except but that you navigate your shared knowledge structures? Well, if you can think of communication systems that are fairly unambiguous, so uh, Velvet Monkey is an example. Okay, you have three reference and three messages, but it works pretty well for what they need to do. And there, there is no need to navigate any uh, epistemic space. It is fairly uh, straightforward. You are uh, told you have some predisposition towards certain calls, but you basically converge uh, through the community into knowing that a certain call has a certain reference. And the way we use language and the way language is study, I have the impression sometimes that how we think of it, and I want to make the point that that is definitely an important feature of communi human communication, but it, by itself I don't think is enough to resolve all the ambiguities that are present. Thank you. Um, I, I want to make sure I understood, first of all, the task. So the uh, communicator uh, uh, gives some information, yeah. and, and, uh, and so there's a specific target, and then uh, the person who's being communicated to with is uh, trying to replicate, duplicate that, um, the intention of the um, communicator. It's not replication, it's an interpretation. So you don't imitate the movement, you don't replicate the movement, you need to well, interpret. You, you replicate the end, the outcome. There is you have to have, okay, that's what, then I didn't understand what, so, uh, so I mean, there, could, there's a, there are tokens, they're not types, right? So, yes. so what the communicator is saying, in other words, there's only one solution, uh, a very specific solution that is right. Mm, no. Okay, then I'm, I do not understand the task. Yeah. So, Am I the only well, one? The, the, the game is set. The solutions, yes, there is one solution that is right. But the way you can convey that particular oh. solution and the way it can be interpreted by another C, that is open for negotiation. Right. So, 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 so okay, then, then what I meant by a token is that mm -hmm. there's only one possible interpretation. Uh, it's not that there is a, a, a range, if you will. So you, you're, uh, you're communicating about uh, uh, having a picnic uh, or having fun. Uh, fun can be implemented as having a picnic, going to a movie, going to... Uh, and so all of those would be correct solutions to let's have fun. Uh, and uh, uh, so what is being communicated here are really tokens, specific kinds of outcomes, uh, and not types of outcomes. Well, there is a and in language, we don't necessarily, I think going back to the point that uh, Sharon was saying, when we understand, we think we understand each other, it's enough if we kind of understand each other. So it's enough if, uh, if yeah, it's, uh, we're going to have fun, and perhaps it's not the specific details of how we're going to have fun, it's not really crucial. So, so what, I guess what I'm asking is, 
the communication that you're looking at here, this particular paradigm, is trying to get the, um, uh, the listener uh, to uh, figure out exactly the specific meaning uh, at a very concrete level. That's true, given the, the space of possibility. So the question was, have you tried to go beyond that? Yep. Yes, we, we operationalize the space in a fairly precise manner. It's true that there is no space for approximation. You cannot get the solution almost right. Um, I'm not sure that would simplify the I'm not sure that will simplify the problem. Sorry? I'm not sure that will simplify the problem. I was trying to yeah. sort of what is the real world? In the real world it, the, the kind of things we understand are approximate and and you don't give us a chance to have an approximate understanding. You only want to have a precise understanding. And how realistic is that in the ways in which, in the world in which we live. Okay, fair point. I think Jerry has uh, the last question. <laughs> so um, I guess this is a different way of asking what Alfonso is asking, which is what is it you're modeling here? So it's not, for example, the emergence of Nicaraguan sign language. Um, it's not even colonizing a, a communicatively virgin landscape because the um, two interlocutors have a shared goal that they are given. They're put in front of computers. They're denied the usual social interactions that may normally accompany um, two people meeting for the first time and trying to communicate. Um, they're in this sort of very odd situation where I can't pick up the orange thing and show you what I want to do. So I, I'm trying to understand what, what this is. A, in a sense, all of us, when we do have a task, that task is a model of something. I'm trying to understand what your task is a model of. Well, once you, have, you know that you're in a communicative setting, it's true, we don't, people don't need to figure out that they are in a communicative setting. We tell them. And... Uh, <clears throat> We don't give, give them access to pre-existing common ground. But still, the assumption here, and I admit it's an assumption, is that you still need to sort of cover the last mile. Even after you have this communicative ground, even after you have a common idiom, you still need to somehow zoom in on fairly precise uh, referent given a certain signal. And it's true that it might be good enough to go in the neighborhood of that referent, but sometimes it's quite crucial to get it particularly right. And the idea there is with uh, this set of studies to sort of see how we cover this last mile when you sort of exclude all the uh, pre-existing ex existing ground, how you can uh, still converge despite not having any, anything to, to work with and what inferential mechanisms allow you to uh, achieve this convergence. Thank you very much. Thanks. Nobody, because um, this is the oh, thank you. This is this is the end of the meeting, and uh, I think we need to thank very much all the speakers uh, who uh, put. Um, their heart and soul into preparing terrific lectures. So please, um, uh, let, let's again uh, show our appreciation by uh, applauding loudly for all of the speakers. I, I think also. Um, we, we have an organizing committee, uh, Alfonso and uh, Alex, myself, uh, Brad, uh, Sharon, and we have one member uh, who really does all the heavy lifting, and uh, that person is Marius Pelin. Marius, are you, are you here? So I, I think we have to have a special um, uh, hand clapping uh, for Marius.
So uh, I'd like uh, uh, to thank Alessia and her team at GMAC who've done a wonderful job in, uh, behind the scenes and putting this all together, arranging the hotels, making sure we ended up at the right place at the right time, and everything else that all of those uh, wonderful people do that make conferences work. So please, once more. And I'd like to thank uh, the young lady on the phone over here <coughs> uh, for running around uh, and <laughs> I'm thanking you. <laughs> and finally, thanks to all of you uh, for being a terrific audience, listening carefully, asking spot on questions and really making chaos a success. And great posters, right, absolutely. Mustn't forget the posters, absolutely. Thank you. So we'll, we'll see you all uh, at the banquet at uh, 7.30.